and welcome to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK, with myself, Tom Hayes, a Saving Lives trustee who's been living with HIV for 10 years, and Dr. Naomi Sutton, an NHS consultant and star of Channel 4's Sex Clinic. Sex Unwrapped is a podcast exploring everything sex. Together with our guests, we'll be exploring sex, sexuality, sexual health and sexual pleasure. Basically, everything to do with sex. So slip into something more comfortable and let's go. Um, I'm going to introduce our next fabulous guest, Kate Lister. So she's a lecturer in the School of Arts and Communication at Leeds Trinity University. Kate primarily researches the literary history of sex work and curates the online research project, Whores of Your, which is fabulous on Twitter. It's an interdisciplinary digital archive for the study of historical sexuality. She regularly writes about the history of sexuality for iNews, Vice and the Wellcome Trust. And Kate won the Sexual Freedom Publicist of the Year Award in 2017. And she's the author of The Curious History of Sex, which is literally one of my favourite books. Well, oh. is what hopefully we're going to talk a lot about. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. Oh, That's quite you. an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. I always struggle with with writing biographies or, or giving someone a biography to introduce you to. I think it's a very British thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it is. we're not we're not good at pushing ourselves forward. We just kind of want to go. Oh, just just say here's Kate. She's a human. She knows some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like hearing it said that by Naomi, that was that was really lovely. Thank you. Oh, yeah, there's lovely. lots of things that British aren't good at uh, bigging ourselves up and oh, talking awful. about sex. Yeah, two oh. two of those things. I'm I'm better at the talking about sex. I'm terrible at bigging myself up. If I, I had a meeting the other day with um on Zoom with, with some American people who were talking about my book, and they they were they were full Americans, so they were super positive, and they were like saying loads of lovely nice things about it, and I just looked like a frightened rabbit in the headlights. I didn't know what to do with it. I was just I was like, you need to take it down a notch. We're British. We're we're no good at this. Um, I'm a complete fan girl of yours, and. Uh, I came across your book. I think it was on the halls of your website. Someone had put something about it. So I went on and bought it. And for me, it was eye-opening. It really was. I mean, I've worked in sexual health for not too long, but 2007, um, but obviously as a doctor. And I think the history of where we come from um, explains a lot of our ridiculous notions about um, well, about our feelings about sex. So just just tell me, what, what was your inspiration to write the book? I think you've probably just nailed it there. Oh. Is, 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 but that, that's okay. it. Is, it. You know, it's like looking, when you look at the history of sex, it's such a vast subject, you know, but whatever it is that you're looking at, so if you're looking at sexual health, the history of that will shed so much light on yeah. where we are today and how people cope with it and stigma and treatment and all of these things. And it really informs what's going on now. In It, it just always blows my mind when you can kind of make links like yeah. that, you know, like you, even though you're reading about, I don't know, like treatment of syphilis in the 17th century, is you can still see, oh my, we're still, the links you can still see like the, the very human reaction to things like that and that that always blows my mind because that makes history very alive and very important in a way that I that I think is absolutely crucial to studying it it has to be relevant to today I think yeah me, me and Tom were talking earlier about um because I'd like to believe that we're progressing <laughs> and that we're changing <laughs> I I don't know whether it's whether we're clan-like or cultural because I mean what one of my favorite bits is the way people used to scapegoat certain women mm. and you know as witches and they used to keep penises in bird boxes in trees apparently which I completely love I'm all over that I'm gonna buy a box for, for my that tree. The Sandra Bullock movie <laughs> <laughs> um but you know that Throughout history, there's always been somebody that we need to scapegoat. And is that because we need to feel better about ourselves or, you know, and do you think that we're changing or do you think we're just moving our blame somewhere else? Mm. So I think that we have definitely changed and moved forward and evolved the conversation around sex in really important and and vital ways and it's easy to lose sight of that especially like you know when like homophobia is still such a big thing and stigma is still here and there are places around the world where you could be put to death mm. just for who you fancy and the kind of sex that you like having and it's easy to look at that and think have we come very far at all but I think it's really important as well to 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 like acknowledge that 
we have. I mean, even the fact that we, we're we sat here having this conversation today, that's mm. a massive step forward. Maybe that wouldn't have even happened 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, let alone hundreds of years ago. The fact that we're having these conversations, the fact that we are open to discussing sexuality, kinks, STIs, and there are people working really hard to challenge the stigma. That's absolutely vital. And it's leaps forward from where we have been. So even though it's easy to look at it and go, God, we've got such a long way to go. <laughs> right, yeah, but it's it. we do have to see how far we've come. And I think that kind of what you're dealing with there is humans are, we're sort of animals that that think far too much. It's basically what a human <laughs> is. And anxious ang- monkeys. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We are anxious monkeys. We get so hung up about stuff. And sex is definitely one of those areas that we have overthought. So do humans scapegoat certain social groups? Yeah, they do. And they have done all throughout history. And I think that is a very animal instinct kind of tribal, I'll be mean to this person so then they can't get me kind of thing. And that's the exact kind of thing that anthropologists work on, is that really primitive part of the brain that, mm. that kicks in once in a while, that is the anxious monkey that just goes, you know, the, 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 the one that rages when you're in the car that someone cuts you off front or the one that, you know, your, your instant reaction is to like be angry or to say, no, that's mine and I'm keeping it all or whatever it is. And that we're always dealing with that as, as a species, aren't we? Is that we have this really nasty streak in us that we can, that we will persecute a group of people because I suppose it, if we perceive them as being a threat somehow, whatever that threat is, and it, they very, very rarely are a threat, but yeah. if you create that fear and stigmatize a group, it will eventually enable all kinds of violence against them. And humans have done that, unfortunately, all throughout history. And I, I love to think that we would stop doing that, but you only have to look around to realize you know, we're still doing it. <laughs> I, mean, I wish yeah. we weren't, but we still yeah. are. You can see, so obviously we've come a long way with LGB acceptance and, mm-hmm. and, and and so you know we can now get married and there are all sorts of protections in place for us but we're doing exactly the same thing to trans people now yeah and it's like we did this for the last 50 years come on and yeah like, we've no. and that's that's what the study of history really shows you is this cyclical thing you know is that, that even within it doesn't even have to be hundreds of years like a decade you know of how radically attitudes shift is it wasn't that long ago that gay people were being called uh, pedophiles who were a threat to our children who were going to attack people who were you know that they were a threat to heterosexual mm-hmm. and, it's just, and it's the same narratives it's the same stuff that's now being tried out again to stigmatize trans people this kind of imaginary trans boogeyman that's going to haunt toilets and attack random women are just and it's it's the same narrative that's now been projected onto it's so unimaginative as well i know come up with something better like we could you know like at least like they're supernatural or they're gonna you know they've got fangs or something let's 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 raise the level of ridiculousness let's try i, I still find it fascinating that people are so bothered about what other people are doing in their bedroom yeah that always blows my mind that one of just like yeah but this this group of people, they're not affecting you. They have zero impact on your life or who you choose to fancy or who you want to choose to fancy. Just because this guy, why is his sex life anything to do with you? But it's a weird thing is that people assume ownership of it. Like they somehow it's been, they think that it affects them. And I can never quite unpick what that is, is that why they feel entitled. But it's the same thing with a lot of things, like uh, fat shaming, for example, yeah. that, that we get into a lot, but we, you actually sort of like push a pause on that and go, yeah, but like what business is it of yours? Yeah. You know, even if, even if we could absolutely conclusively prove that being overweight means that you're horrendously unhealthy and all that stuff, it's still none of your business. Yeah. They're not coming to your house eating your food, you know. No. I, no, I have a friend who worked as a, a big, beautiful woman escort. She made a lot of money. And she would she just <laughs> say, Look, unless unless you're buying my food or I'm sitting on your face, it is none of your business how big I am. <laughs> 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 it's just that's it you know but it's it's weird that we do that is that we feel entitled to comment and get angry about other people's lifestyles that have zero impact on us they yeah. have nothing to do like as long as everybody's consenting and everyone's like, nothing to do with us but it can really rile rile people up you know it's a threat somehow isn't it 
Well, yeah, it's it's kind. Of, I think it's kind of a threat, or also it's it's just almost a morbid fascination. So it's kind of mm. what, you know we all like watching murder things. Yes. Yeah, no one wants to be murdered or actually ever be in that situation. But it's almost this, you know, put anything about sex or murder or death or something really awful, and we're yeah. all just fascinated, aren't we? Yep, endlessly fascinated. And I think as well that there's a lot of research that goes on to this about like how um, humans act as a group and how they sort of basically police themselves when it comes to social norms. Like who tells us what to do? Because people don't sit down and say, you must be mean about fat people. Or they don't say, but it's a message that we pick up somewhere. And there's a lot of theories about where this comes from. And one of the ones that I find the most interesting is we attack people whose lifestyles deviate from what the dominant cultural yeah. message is because we have to work to keep to that. So if the dominant cultural message is be thin, be in the gym, this is what you need to look pretty. And we all have to like, like when people work hard and, and then you internalize the message and you effectively become the own police state for it because we're now that message has been so internalized that we perceive people that don't do that as a threat because, well, we're doing it. Yeah. And we attack. But that's one of the theories as, as why people, human beings police each other's behaviors and sexualities and why we do that. But I guess that, that maybe gives us hope that if, if these messages start changing, even though it will take generations, actually we can get there. I, hope. I was, you know, I, I mean, obviously this Sarah Everard, um, mm thing about you know men and whatever and it's all um it, it's kind of just blown up hasn't it and yeah and it's very obvious now that women do feel vulnerable and mm. all women will feel vulnerable and I was I mean I love the stat when was it rape within marriage became a crime in 1994 yep um but it doesn't stop rape just because it's a crime doesn't stop it but actually the fact that it was only recognized that this was wrong in 1994 is it's so bizarrely shocking, I think. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, but I, I, yeah, maybe the more we talk about these things and the more we, you know, chat and challenge, then mm. hopefully it will get better for the future generations. But this is exactly what has to happen. It is conversations that kind of drag this stuff out, make everybody have a proper look at it. And it yeah. is uncomfortable a lot of time for a lot of people. To, and that's why people react very defensively to it is because... Yeah, you know, they start to think, oh, oh, are you attacking me? I mean, it, you yeah. know, the I like rape within marriage, we reckon in nice night night four is is just insane. Yeah. But we're still in a process of understanding what sexual assault is. Yeah. And one of like the the because we still have this idea that the only thing that quote unquote counts as rape is is being dragged off the street in a dark corner, battered around the head, and left. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of victims of sexual assault. The process that they go through with the trauma is recognizing that they have been a victim yeah. of sexual assault because for, it often gets dismissed or covered up. They're like, oh, I, I got really drunk. Or, oh, I didn't really want to. Or, or you know, oh, he was just going on about it so much that I just I just said yes. Or like, and that's the process that we're in right now is unpicking what actually consent means. It doesn't have to be as extreme as what a lot of people would imagine it is and those are really important conversations to be having and I'm glad that we're having them as well because that's how it'll change. So you've got an incredibly um, popular Twitter account, Whores of Yore, Do, yeah. um, which I love following by the way. Oh thank um, you. So where did the idea of Whores, Whores of Yore come from? Um, it came from, I was researching the history of sex work um, I was doing a postdoc by that point and, um, and it was something I was getting more and more interested in and I found this reference to a woman that was arrested in London in the 14th century who gave her name as Clarice Clatterbollocks and I just I thought that just, <laughs> I thought that was so funny because like, it's, it's obviously an alias that she's given but it's, it, the joke is still funny like 700 years it's still funny so I thought I want to share this I want to like tweet things that that I find and and then I thought oh whore rhymes with your I'm so clever and <laughs> so, so I started the feed and then and then people seem to really enjoy it and then it, it it got bigger and I'm really lucky that I've got the people who tend to follow the account are lovely and they're really funny they make me laugh every single day the comments and stuff that they come up with on some of the stuff I post but it just became bigger and people were sending me stuff and they wanted more and it, it was just one of those 
those things and people just seem to like it. One of your posts in the last week made me howl. It was um, the etymology of the word tail juice. I don't know if to explain for our listeners what tail juice is. Yeah, so that's one of the things that, that I'm really interested in, is the history of slang and slang terms, because I think that that shows a lot about attitudes and how they've they've developed. And so I, I do a word of the day every every day on the halls of your feed. And people often say, you made that up. I really haven't, I promise. And tail juice uh, was slang for semen, which uh, I think that that's, it's a really good one. When was it? Is it 17th century? I think, but yeah, think, tail juice. Yeah. It was 18th century, I should remember. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I really like that one. I think my actual all-time favourite slang term uh, was one for cunnilingus and it was sneezing in the cabbage it was just such a mad oh image <laughs> <laughs> now I, I have that image in my head <laughs> I can't get rid of it. <laughs> I think that that one's oh. like 19th century and it's just such I, I don't know why it works but it does and it just it just really tickles me sneezed oh. in the cabbage yeah I love the word of the day and so where do you get all the wonderful images you post? And you know, also thank you for the hot men you've started posting. Well. <laughs> yeah, historical the historical hotties. The historical hotties. They were brought, they started because when I was right at the beginning, if you post a lot of vintage erotica, you quickly realise that most of it is of women because it's it's like the, the male gaze and it's focused on yeah. the women's body. So finding erotic images of men is significantly harder. And so people were pointing out, oh, we got any images of men? And I was like, well, kind of, but like as just like by themselves, like a vintage gay rotter or something, it's there, but there's not as much. So I started doing the historical hotties to try and even up the, the eye candy on offer. Uh, and I need to be more careful with that actually, because people have started sending me, like tweeting me their historical hotties who are often their relatives, which is is lovely and that's really nice but like once or twice like people have caught me out like the other day someone posted a picture of Jeffrey Dahmer I fucking liked it didn't I I was like oh my god so I had to go back and didn't check didn't check who that was um but yeah that slight error aside it's it's really lovely like looking at all the old pictures I love that um I'm I'm uh, well I'm interested in female pleasure partly because I'm a female and I feel especially on social media at the moment there's a big push for I guess equal um equaling out female slash male pleasure and the whole mm. idea that actually especially for cis women who are heterosexual that actually um being oh what's what's um vagina relates to the sword sheath holder <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah you're right uh, the word vagina um that comes into English in the 17th century and it is taken verbatim from the Latin vagina which means sheath or scabbard something that the sword goes into yeah. so the entire etymological function of a vagina is to hold a sword hold so if that doesn't tell you something about like the power balances implicit in the very language that we yeah. use the, yeah. the vagina is described as a holding point for a sword so yeah so first of all it's I think we're programmed that sex should be penis into vagina and women should, yeah. you know love it that's great um but I was interested you know back in I think it was in the Victorians you know women if well first of all they weren't allowed to, to ride a bike because they'd go crazy <laughs> with yeah. overstimulation of their vulval area um but also the removal of clitorises which you know obviously still goes on today um but you know was still was happening within um I guess British culture which yeah. really me. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Um, yeah, F FGM is still obviously a massive issue around the world today. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's very easy for people to go, oh, but that's something that they do in, in, in those other countries. It would never happen here. Well, it did happen here. It absolutely did. Um, I'm afraid doctors have been mangling vulvas and various parts of them for an awfully long time. And although I don't think you could ever make the case that clitorectomies were widespread, it was certainly not a fringe quack uh, treatment that this was uh, in the 19th century a guy called Dr Isaac Baker Brown he's become kind of like the pan pantomime villain of clitorectomies because he published all this research about how it really helped all these women with their problems and there was like one poor woman who just didn't want to be with her husband so he decided to perform a clitorectomy and then then she suddenly decided okay I'll stay with her brilliant well done uh, but like even at the time doctors were very angry with him and called him out and I think he was eventually struck off but he says at his own hearing quite tellingly it's like there are lots of men in this room right now who are judging me who I know have performed 
clitorectomies. So it was, yeah, and that was in the 19th century. And the history of it can be traced right back to uh, ancient Greece, to ancient Egypt. And it's often this idea, it's about curbing sexual sexual desire and preventing lesbianism seems to come in quite a lot with this. Uh, And the clitoris is viewed almost as like a little mini penis. Yeah. The, that you need to cut cut out in order to curtail um, a wayward sexual desire. I mean, embryologically, it is a little mini penis, really. Mm. I guess what, what I find interesting is was women, as, although on social media there's you know a big um, emphasis on pleasure, is I still have women in my clinic who won't touch themselves, look at themselves. They go, "I'm really sorry that you have to look at me," mm. and you know this kind of shame and embarrassment about our own bodies. Yeah. which you know must derive from all these sort of cultural yeah. norms that have made us feel that we're wrong to want to have sex or you know we're wrong to want pleasure or yeah. so again we you know we're fighting so many things as women to- yeah absolutely and I mean if you think about it like anyone who happens to own a vulva uh, they're lovely things but if like you sort of think like nobody sits down and goes it 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 stinks actually it's, it's a horrible awful dirty thing and and nobody ever wants to be around it or it's very rarely people say that to you but this is a message that you receive from a very very young age and if you just start to think about like where did that come from it comes from jokes that you first hear in the playground perhaps it comes from slang that alludes the vulva to uh, fish or to meat or to you know like a badly stuffed kebab or you know a fish pie none of that sounds great does it so like you know you're oh it's you know congratulations on being hilarious but it's it like you start to take on this message of like god it it smells like fish and then like you get a little bit older and people and and if the only vulvas that you're seeing are in porn which are um like heavily uh waxed and stylized they might have had um the, the the labia trimmed back and of course it's all very carefully edited you'd be forgiven as an impressionable person for thinking mine doesn't look like that yeah. Mine doesn't look, mine, mine's weird. And then like you start to look around and you notice things like it's got specialized cleaning equipment now that, you know, that you need um, Femme Fresh or other brands are available. Or yeah. like, you know, you need, there's a specialist wash or there's a specialist douche or there's, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow steaming oh, it over, a, over a cooking eggs. pot or whatever she was doing. Yes, like jade eggs that are sold as like detoxing the vulva and all of this stuff comes together to reinforce the message that it's dirty that it needs it needs to be waterboarded before it's allowed out it needs to be like like waxed and plucked and preened and scrubbed and buffed and bejazzled and and all this stuff and all of that comes together to create shame if anyone is listening the vagina or the 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 sheath Mm. is a (laughs) cleaning tube it never washed and also, if, um, there's a really great site called Labia Libraries. It's an Australian site, and there's loads of normal vulvas on show. Because I think the problem is, is if you're not a lesbian, yep. or you don't work in sexual health, um, you don't see normal vaginas. So yep. you know, the only access to them is porn, um, which, as you said, they're often, you know, plucked, mm-hmm. raised, whatever. Um, but this is a really good site for normalising what yep. we look like. Um, yeah. So yeah, anyone who's stressed or worried, check it out. So as a as a gay man, obviously I'm I'm not that intimately involved with vaginas, <laughs> but I do work for a sexual health charity. There's so much mystery around them, especially at a school age and teenage um, age. It's not really discussed. It's not really talked about. And then that, you end up with those slang sort of silly phrases in the playground. But then you see it in the media as well, don't you? female pleasures like Nomi said riding a bike or women having to ride horse side to or the weird ones like mum sat on tumble drives it's like yep we'll do anything to talk about it but actually discuss what a vagina is how it works and how pleasure works yeah uh, we're not good at having that conversation and we tend to if, it's, if there's any kind of discussion about female sexuality it tends to be um, sort of like caveated somehow or dismissed somehow like look at the media for example so this, I think that this is a really interesting example so Fifty Shades of Grey which um, you know like it or love it it's an absolute juggernaut of a, a cultural phenomenon thing and that was absolutely dismissed in the press as mummy porn which is an in like you know why are you that's just a strange thing to say is and and it somehow like takes away from it and it others it and it makes it silly 
somehow, you know, and that's that's an interesting thing of how we reacted to that, or that it's mummy porn, you know. Yeah, and what what is mummy? What, how what is mummy porn? Mummy? Why shouldn't mummy have porn? Let mummy have porn for goodness <laughs> sake. And also, we get better with age, women. We become more sexually confident. You know, we know how our bodies work better. Yep. So, you know, go mummies. Go mummies. Absolutely. Yeah. Another topic you talk about a lot, and is one of my favourite topics, is sex work. Um, as a charity, Saving Lives are very strongly behind the Decriminalise Now movement and supporting sex workers um, in conducting their, their, their work, which is vital and should be legal, um, and to get the support they need by financial, sexual health, uh, mental health. In recent years, I mean, it's been the case for a long time, but even more so in recent years with the uh, sort of birth of platforms like OnlyFans and Just for Fans, mm. it's kind of been a widening of the gap between porn and content creation sex work, which is kind of seen as all right and okay and like good for you. And the sort of in-person sex work, so working in brothels, working streets, being an escort, which is, I f- feels like it's just as stigmatized as it always was. Yeah. Why do you think one arm of sex work is now almost completely palatable to society and the other one is just as stigmatised as ever? Uh, what you address now is something that, that sex workers themselves refer to as the hierarchy, which which I really like, which is this constant, because it's an internalised form of stigma, is that we still have this idea. I mean, if you think about the word prostitute, if I say the word prostitute, images come to your mind because of the social conditioning that we've all received. And they probably won't be very positive. It's what you've seen in the media. You might think like out on the street, uh, drugs, trafficking, violence, all of these things, and none of which are um, true, although that can be an experience of sex work. But it's so stigmatized that what you're seeing there is this kind of internalized stigma where people want to distance themselves all the time from what this this kind of stereotyped uh, prostitute figure. And that results in certain types of sex work being more socially palatable and acceptable and that's not new we've done that all throughout history so when you're looking at the fabulously glamorous courtesans who were often the real power behind the throne in medieval or early modern europe like these women were celebrities in their own right and not only were they respected but it was aspirational you would want that job and yet the women working on the street and in the brothels were still heavily stigmatized and legislated against and brutalized. And we're still doing that today. And I think that class actually has an awful lot to do with it. So the one thing that you get when you, you talk about street sex work or maybe even brothel sex work is it tends to be of a demographic that is um that they're not earning as much money as these kind of, you know, oh, I'm on OnlyFans and I'm earning 35 grand a day or whatever it is. And I think that that comes into it a lot actually the kind of message behind it seems to be as long as you're having sex with rich people it's yeah. fine yeah. you know and that's that's very there's this, often people on only fans don't even view it as sex work which is a weird thing that's how heavily internalized we've got or people that, that are uh, using sugar baby sites they wouldn't necessarily see that as sex work but it is and that's another conversation that we need to have is is bringing all these people back in because one of the best way that we could get to challenge this is to understand how widespread and prevalent it is. It would be amazing, wouldn't it, if everyone who's ever done any kind of sex work could be open about it. I think that would change our attitudes overnight. But the other thing is anyone who's ever used the services of a sex worker, if we knew that, that yeah. would change. Because if anybody's ever watched pornography, you've used the services of a sex worker. Yeah. You have. So if you are using and consuming the product, then you should not be judging and criticizing the people in that who are doing it so you can consume it. But we have a real like state of cognitive dissidence around sex work. We re- and always have been. We're really bad for it. We people will criticize sex workers, say it's horrendously abusive and watch porn. Yeah, I, I love that point. If you're watching porn, you're if, yeah. Sex workers. If you've watched porn, you have used the services of a sex worker. Even if that porn is free, that person was paid to make that porn and you consumed it and used it. You've used the services of a sex worker. So don't be so hypocritical as to start saying that, oh, isn't it terrible and awful and it should all be banned and people that use the services of sex workers are absolutely awful because you are one of those people. Exactly. Stop judging. Yes, don't judge. Yeah. Um, I, I particularly like your chapter on... Uh, buzzkill vibrators in the victoria oh, yeah. <laughs> oh god the uh, coming of the machines or whatever it was yeah 
the machine, you know, I mean, obviously now we have amazing vibrators, um, mm. but you know, actually that even back in those days we were using, well, vegetables and yep. all sorts of things, broom handles, I'm sure, or, you know, all sorts of other made up dildos. Um, when did that all start happening? It's a, it's for, like what we have this kind of weird sort of attitude around people having sex in the past, which is that almost that we think, well, they weren't having sex in the past, which is obviously insane because we are the living product that people <laughs> were most definitely having sex. But what we're really not good at recognising is kinky sex is not new. <laughs> having sex for a lot of fun is not new. Having threesomes, oral sex, anal sex, vaginal sex, sex toys, none of that is new. We've been doing it for a very, very long time. And sex toys have been around as long as people have been able to make sex toys. They, they have um, found stone phalluses that are 36,000 years old that may well have been early sex toys. But there's reference to sex toys in some of the, the earliest writings that we've got they're normally disparaging they're normally talking about women who, who have to get themselves off with a vegetable but you know when you get into the early modern period there's really like detailed descriptions of the sex toys that people are using that they're, they're made of leather or they might be some of them made of wood i hope that they're varnished well uh like but some of them are ivory and people have been doing this for a really long time yeah. of course they have of course they have yeah, yeah and you know i don't think sexuality or what we want to do with our bodies has probably changed at all because we've all got urges it's just nope. i guess maybe we're a bit more well we're talking more about it and we're a bit more accepting um, but i mean you know even if you look at the most seven top fantasies it's the same, it's the same. everybody you know everyone fantasizes about the same kind of things in the majority of the time so you, it does make sense doesn't it we're not suddenly evolved to love no. a, a no. i mean sex has remained fairly consistent however you uh, like it since since the dawn of time what changes is the technology that allows us <clears throat> to have sex that often people can think oh god we're all going to hell in a handbasket now not like the good old days so things like um, sex robots so the technology is new but the the need for a sex doll to have sex with an animal object is not new at all that can be traced right the way back to ancient greece and rome and the the story of pygmalion and you know creating a beautiful woman out of a statue and all of these like the men want to have sex with that's a none of this is new how how we actually go about it and express it is new but not the actual urges themselves no and hopefully maybe we're becoming more accepting then as time hopefully. goes on because you know. <laughs> I, I think we are i yeah. think if you look at jokes like one of the questions that i get asked <clears throat> a lot is was there any period in time that they'd kind of got it right that it was like a sexual utopia and everyone was just dancing around, having sex with whoever they wanted, uh, round a bonfire in the nip or whatever it is. <laughs> and I, I think the answer to that is the most sexually liberated time uh, is our own, actually, in this culture, in our own. And I say that well aware of all the issues that we have, as, is, as you are and as are all the people listening to this. But we are now at a point I think where we are more aware, we are more tolerant, we are more prepared to listen and to create space to have these discussions and conversations and allow people to explore sexuality. And even though it's often still heavily stigmatized, and even though there's still lots of issues, I think that we're closer now than we have been ever. Yeah, and, really do. and maybe that's because we're so much better at because of the internet and communication yeah. I guess if you were the only gay in the village back in you know Victorian times you didn't leave the village you would be seeing yourself right. as abnormal so at least we can share you know we now know the there are other right. people like us which then normalizes us doesn't it and makes you feel Absolutely. less better. And I think it wasn't that long ago <laughs> <laughs> when no. I was a teenager I was as far as I'm aware the only gay in a tiny village in Worcestershire <laughs> Yeah. And then around my 14th birthday, you know, the internet started being popular and I could go on gay.com and gaydar and, you know, yeah. as secretly, because, you know, I was under 18 and like, there are other gays. There are other, there are other, there are other gays. <laughs> what, what I find dreadfully sad, and, and you still see to some element, is when people feel so pressured into being conforming. So, for example, a, a man who would ideally have sex with men, but then gets married and procreates and has women a bit like I mean Philip Schofield you know was that yeah. part of pressure 
from what normal should be. Mm. Um, and I hope that, that there was some, I was reading some stats the other day and, and people are much more likely now to call themselves, uh, you know, bisexual or pansexual or, mm. you know, there's much more, we understand it's a sliding scale now. Yeah. You know, if you look at what people would class themselves of over the age of 60, it's heterosexual and then a small portion of gay. So, mm -hmm. so I think we are learning and we are becoming much more, fluid in our thoughts and probably I think we've always been fluid in sexuality I think we're just mm. accepting I don't think we've changed physically or sexually I just think we're nope. rephrasing it I suppose and we we also develop more nuanced language with which to express yeah. it like it's we often overlook the how important language is in even like how we understand ourselves and our sexuality but if you don't have the words to describe something how do you tackle it so like it, it wasn't until like the 19th century even the 20 like maybe even a bit uh later than that that you would say i am a homosexual i am gay like there wasn't the language before that there was no i am gay that wasn't a thing of course same sexual attraction and behavior has always existed but it wasn't something that you were it wasn't an identity yeah. it was something that you did so you wouldn't have said i am gay because that so like what was it like to live in that time then yeah. when you don't even have the language to try and understand your attraction you know and that's the, the reason that, that kind of we view sexuality as binary is because we only had binary language to talk about it you are either straight or you're gay and even the fact that we're trying to put labels on sexuality effectively cl closes it in i'm really pleased that there are lots more expressions on pansexual bisexual demisexual but it's all about trying to put pe labels on things and human sexuality doesn't really work mm. like that it it just is a kind of a law unto itself you know that no one is really a hundred percent i'm definitely heterosexual and even if you think you are what does that even mean <laughs> I don't know. like you know like what why, does do you, that, why do you need to tell people why why do you tell people or like just what does that mean that you never ever find anyone of the same sex attractive ever that you couldn't even like appreciate that so like what does it mean yeah. but to human and but then you know if you say and also you have the kind of issue that if you label yourself that boom i'm definitely heterosexual it creates barriers that are very difficult to overcome in because if you, you understand yourself within those terms if your sexuality perks up one day and goes well quite fancy him that's suddenly very difficult for you yeah. because you understand yourself only as this and that creates shame it, human sexuality doesn't work like that really does all kinds of crazy stuff. So is there anything you'd like to promote on today's podcast? Ooh, now then. Uh, I do have a, a new book coming out, actually. Yeah. Ooh, so tell I, us I've, all. Well, I've not been allowed to tell people, really. <gasps> so, yeah, so you can have you can have this scoop. Um, so it is a book on the history of sex work, and it's coming out with Thames and Hudson, who do these lovely, um, like, they really image heavy sort of histories of and they've allowed me to do one on sex work and that's coming out in september awesome. yeah so it's not as funny as curious history of sex um i didn't want it to be i wanted it to sort of be a slightly different tone and to respect it although people who have read it already say things like oh it's very witty so, well it's not supposed to I'm, that's me being <laughs> serious so, but <laughs> obviously i'm not very good at that but um yes yeah, so I'm, I'm really proud of that book and i really yeah i'm really pleased for people to see that one i can't wait and where can people find you online they can find me on twitter as um either at whores of your or uh kate underscore lister kate with a, just a k and a t and uh, I'm on Instagram as well, but they keep threatening me to kick me off. So I don't know how long I'll be there. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's where you can get hold of me. Ah. We'll put description and links down below. Thank you so much for joining us today, Kate. Oh, it was a it's pleasure. It's been Thank hilarious you. and so fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. It's lovely to talk to you. Thanks ever so much. Take care. Bye. 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 So that's today's show. Thank you for listening to Sex Unwrapped, a podcast by Saving Lives UK. Please remember to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, SoundCloud or wherever you get your podcasts. Saving Lives is a UK charity committed to improving the sexual health of the nation. To find out more about Saving Lives UK and to find out where you can get a sexual health or HIV test, head to savinglivesuk.com. <laughs>